Uh, hello, welcome to this really special show. One of the things that you probably don't spend enough time doing, and you should be doing a lot more of it, is thinking about the future. And in particular, thinking about the march of technology and the march of exponential technology. Because in all probability, in the next 10 years, 15 years, maybe sooner, that march of technology is going to change the world as you know it. It's going to change the world in giving you abundant energy, abundant water, artificial intelligence is here, which is going to be having massive impacts on all sorts of the world. Personalized medicine is going to be here, genomics, robotics, nanotechnology, you name it. There's a range of technology that is upon us. And there are a handful of people in the world who've really spent some time looking at it, analyzing it, understanding it, predicting it, and looking both at the positives of it, because it can transform our world and our lives in a very positive fashion, but also some of the potential pitfalls and some of the negatives, and hence some of the choices that we can that we can possibly make. And it's a privilege to have joining us one of the people who's really been leading that entire charge, Vivek Vadra, the author of the driverless uh, driver in the driverless car and a number of other projects. One of the best known people uh, in, in looking at the future and, and, and in seeing which way that's going. So Vivek, thank you so much for being for yeah. being here and it's great to have you here in India. You've spent so much time looking at the future and you worked with some of the others who are doing it. The Singularity Institute, for example, and Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis and others who've made a name in saying the future is coming and sooner than we, than we can care to look at it. Um, Perhaps you can tell us what's really driving it. Is it that exponential curve that technology is on? Is that, is that the secret? Vikram, uh, when I came through customs this time, the, uh, they didn't stop me. When I used to come here 10, 15 years ago, they would confiscate your laptops because they were worried about you bringing electronics in. If you went back 30 years, do you remember those great supercomputers that America were not allowed to enter the United States? By my estimate, this is 40 times more powerful than the great supercomputers were. No one even blinked an eyelid. No one cared about what I brought into the country, right? This is on an exponential curve. What happens is that computing technology has been doubling in its capabilities almost every 18 months for the past 100 years. So at the rate at which this is progressing, within six years from now, this will have the same computing power that a human brain does. Within eight years from now, it'll have the same computing power as two human beings, and so on. So this is making everything possible. This is making it possible to solve the grand challenges of humanity and to disrupt societies. Yeah. There are one of the things that I saw in your book about the matching the human brain. Now, that's obviously in, in processing power in, in terms of me megaflops or petaflops or whatever it's going to be by that time. Uh, but the human brain still has got that complexity of massive parallel computing, which no device can do. But it also runs on 20 watts of electricity, which <laughs> no, no device has yet been able to right. do. So will it be able to replicate what the human brain can do to that extent? Well, massively parallel computing. You know um, what our children are using in their games? It's there's a graphic processing unit by NVIDIA. It's a massively parallel computer. What's being used now in um, refrigerators are, you know, are the equivalent of supercomputers from, from a few years ago. So the answer is yes, you'll be able to do it. And who says you have to have something the size of a human brain? Why can't you have a computer the size of this room, which can now you know, control whatever you need it to control. So yeah. we have limits because we have to be mobile. Those computers can be connected to the internet and be anywhere and they be any size. So the answer is yes, all of this stuff is happening. Okay, let's just take a look at some of the stuff that is happening and uh, you know, get you to talk about it and then a little later come to the ethics and the possible pitfalls around some of it, which is loss of jobs, loss of autonomy, lots of all sorts of things. And of course, I'm not even going into the existentialist threat of a super intelligent AI system coming and wiping out mankind, which worries you know, Stephen Hawking and others. Uh, maybe we can touch it in, in the end. Let's come to the good news first. Um, you've written, and it's, it's increasingly seeming possible, that some of the biggest challenges that we as a species and as a planet face today are actually going to be solved yeah. in 15 years. And we look back at a time and saying, were we really worried about it? Exactly. Take, take water, for example. A lot of people in this country and elsewhere are saying, 10 to 15 years from now, we're going to have water wars. Take energy. We, we have a feeling that energy is going to be a problem. You seem to be saying that with technology, right. neither will you have water shortages, nor will you have energy. You will have almost unlimited, virtually free energy and water. You know, if you look at a map of India, you see it's surrounded by water. There's so much water that India could possibly not consume it. 
The trouble is that to uh, turn that water into drinkable water, usable water, you have to boil it. To boil it, you need energy. Energy is extremely expensive, but that's changing. The cost of solar has dropped 99% since 1976, and at the rate at which solar is advancing, within about 14 years, it'll be almost free. You know, again, when I coming back, going back in time, when I used to come to India, you used to have those old phones, you had to book STD calls to dial, dial abroad. It would cost hundreds of rupees to make phone calls. Now it's free. Anyone can dial anywhere in the world. The cost of, of telephony has become free. Imagine now the cost of energy being free. Because if the price of solar continues dropping about 18 to 20 percent as it, as it is on, you know, every year, then extrapolate forward. It is almost free. Solar panels will be small, they'll be efficient, we'll have battery storage, which is also very cheap. And each house will be able to be off-grid and have all the energy it wants. Imagine now having buildings in which you have plants being grown, being fed um, artificial light through LED bulbs. LED technology is also advanced exponentially. You know, people are now putting them in their houses, but move forward five years, it'll get cheaper, energy will become cheaper, it's optimized for plant growth. You'll be able to grow, you know, have the equivalent of farms within small buildings and feed an entire neighborhood locally with the price of energy dropping in these LED advances. So, so this, is a, this is almost like a utopian future, but, but it, it is possible because three or four technologies are all progressing at right. an exponential exactly. rate. So along with solar, and are you sure it is going to be solar that it's going to solve the problem and not fusion and stuff like that? And secondly, the battery part, which right. you may briefly mentioned. Today, people are saying great solar is great, but it, you, know, you, you can only have it in the day when the sun is shining. Right. What are you going to do when it's the monsoons or at night? Fusion, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but nuclear energy and, and wind, they make sense. However, you need a reliable grid for that. Here, you don't have a reliable grid. I mean, you, you can be almost anywhere in Delhi, you have power outages. So here, you need to have distributed energy. You need to have villages that are independent, cut off from everywhere else, that have their own solar and, and storage. So that is a likely solution for India, and that's what's going to make the biggest difference over here. Right. Um, Looking at the other aspects of this, people are also saying that as you become better at battery technology, which is obviously what right. will help solve the solar problem, therefore the cars and car technologies, and within 15 to 20 years, you'll have countries like India and China and others which potentially are becoming entirely electric. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. If you look at, again, let's look at the cost of, uh, of batteries. Go back four or five years, we were talking about $500 a kilowatt hour. Now, Tesla's price is about $150, $160 a kilowatt hour. Elon Musk is talking about $100 a kilowatt hour by 2020, 2021. Move forward, $70 a kilowatt hour, the entire economics change. You can now have cars which can go 100 miles, 150 kilometers, which cost about you know, $10,000. Uh, you can now have cars which cost two lakh rupees that can get you all across town, that can go 100 kilometers, and which are now completely clean. You can now have batteries for your house so that, that when it's not sunny, you still have energy. I mean, because one of the biggest problems here is when you lose energy, you have these diesel backups and you know, these old battery systems. Within five years, it'll be affordable. You'll be able to spend maybe a lakh rupees to get an entire house off-grid. That's the type of advance we're talking about. And off-grid means that you can store that, that, that for a rainy day, you right. can store it for, for at night, you don't have a problem. It means you don't have to steal electricity from the grid. Yeah. And you can just have your own house being powered uh, and be independent of everyone. Now, you know, the interesting thing is that this is why it's so important for everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, to start thinking about future technologies, because the implications of what you're saying become massive. Yeah. If what you're saying is correct, then become it's correct. It's happening. All right. So <laughs> let's assume it's happening. If this is happening, then that means all this worrying about what the price of oil and price of petrol is. Why are we worrying about it? The logical price of petrol 20 years from now is $5 or $10. So all this talk about OPEC and what they're going to do and $60 a barrel, it could be $10, $20. Why would anybody be buying it? Vikram, I gave a talk at a very large investment conference in New York City about three or four years ago. They were forecasting $250 a barrel of oil. I walked them through the advances in clean energy. And the question from the audience was, what do you expect the price of oil to be in 2025? I said $50 a barrel. Everyone started laughing at me because they were forecasting you know, uh, uh, $250 a barrel going up to $500 a barrel. God knows what I said. Look, I was being respectful. I actually think it's going to be you know, $30 or $40 a barrel going up to $10 a barrel by 2025. And I was just didn't want to offend you. But if you look at it now, in those days, $50 a barrel seemed 
you know, unthinkable. It's hurling the fifty dollars barrel right now. I think in the twenty twenties we're talking about ten dollars a, 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 a gallon of, of oil. I mean, late twenty twenties, early twenty twenties, we're talking about twenty dollar barrel. Oil will become dirt cheap, but we won't need it here because you're yeah. going to have electric cars. You know, India is one of the most polluted countries in the world now. It's horrible to come here and to see the smog here. That can be fixed within five years. Electric everything, electrify everything, get rid of the diesel generators, get rid of the petroleum cars, and now move to an all-electric economy.